Elizabeth. And so oh, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, here I am. Thank you. Um, I like your shirt. Thank you. I know. I'll buy it off of you for uh, five cents. And a Christmas uh, five. Ah, uh, that is a hard bargain. <laughs> that sense? I am a hard bargain, aren't I? <laughs> um, so then we will have for us some things. Where is Miss Elizabeth? Elizabeth. Don't worry, I'll I'll stare at her until she comes here. <laughs> yeah, that used to be Not to do the words. Who's in here? Who's in here today? Uh, apparently three of us. Okay, you can come. No, yeah, you, feel free. no, you guys are good. You can. <coughs> you want to do the basement? I can get the basement set up. Okay, good morning. It's just about 11.07. It's just about start time. 11.07. Welcome uh, to all of you this morning. And happy Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. So we're starting to get our, our thoughts and our minds geared up towards Easter. And uh, Palm Sunday is the Sunday when we remember... Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And uh, it's, it's a really interesting dichotomy moment because it's the moment that Christ is recognized, at least by portions of society, as king. And so he comes on 
um, this donkey's colt, right? A young donkey that had never been written into Jerusalem. And the crowds are singing Hosanna and they're praising him. And they're laying down um, palm leaves before him and, uh, and recognizing Jesus as that eternal king, right? So, I mean, there was part of society back then that was hoping that he would just be their, their temporal king uh, in their kingdom. But, uh, but the prophecies and who Jesus was and was to be is that he would be king eternal. And so um, I want to just share a portion of scripture from Isaiah here as a scriptural call to worship. So I invite you to stand. Okay, Isaiah 53. And who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He had no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, no appearance that we should be attracted to him. For he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows who was acquainted with grief, and like one from men who uh, hid their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. For surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, and smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through and for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we have been healed. For all of us like sheep have gone astray, <clears throat> each of us has turned his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. For he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. And like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you um, that you were, Lord, that spotless, perfect lamb, that sacrifice once and for all, God, that you were king and king eternal. And we declare that this morning, God. We um, thank you for this opportunity, Lord. We thank you for your promise that where one or more are gathered in your name, Lord, that there your presence is. And so, God, we pray that this morning we would be mindful of that. God, we pray that um, your spirit would be at work this morning, speaking your truth. And, uh, God, we just ask um, that you would take uh, what we have to give, Lord, that you would bless it and that you'd be blessed by the tune of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. He's coming on the clouds, the kings and kingdoms will bow down. chain will break his broken hearts declare his praise who can stop the lord almighty our god is the lion the lion of judah he's roaring with power and fighting our battles and every knee will bow before him our god is the lamb sin of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb oh every knee will bow before him so open up the gates Make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting. 
our battles and every knee will bow before him our god is the lamb the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb oh every knee will bow before For who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 For who can stop the the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before him. Our God is the lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chain. And every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. Okay, we're going to do uh, a newer song. Um, so... If it's your first time, you can listen, listen in, you can sing along, and uh, it's called um, For God So Loved. <clears throat> He gave us His one and only 
I'm walking in freedom for God so loved, God so loved the world. Bring your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. It is good to see you this morning. We're testing out our new mic. We finally got one. This isn't the rented one, so we actually have a new uh, wireless headset mic, and no one has ever worn it before, <laughs> and no one gets to wear it after this either, because once I get it set, I don't want to have anyone else messing it up on me, so no, I'm just kidding. It is good. God is good. Um, we're going to look at the bulletin this morning, go over some announcements. Before we do that, or as we're doing that, we're going to take up the offering this morning, and I already have one volunteer. I got another volunteer over there. Yeah. Actually, Manasseh, can you run to the back of the church? And Mr. Aaron's going to give you a basket. There's one in the back there that I forgot. Excellent. Come on up. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way that you have blessed us. We acknowledge, Lord, that you are very good to us. You have blessed us abundantly. And Lord, I thank you that you have given it to us as a trust, as a stewardship to be used for the work of your kingdom and to glorify you. And so as we give back to you just a small portion of what you have blessed us with, we ask, Lord, that you would take these gifts and offerings, that you would multiply them, and you would use them for the advancement of the name of Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. So I hope you had an opportunity to pick up a bulletin this morning on your way in. If not, there's still a few at the back. I just want to highlight a couple things. You can read... Uh, most of them for yourself. However, I wanted to highlight this one on the very front side of it here. The video selection for the Christian Video Circulation Club has been exchanged, so there's all new videos back there, as well as the ones that we get off of the Christian Video Circulation Club, there's, and there's 60 of them. There was another 20 or 30 that were left in a bag at the back, so we've put them out of the shelf. Uh, I guarantee the quality of none of them, both those that were donated and those that we got from the Christian Video Club. I know that there is a couple that are good because I've watched a couple of them already, not since I picked them up yesterday, just in the past. I would encourage you, go check them out. There is about 15 or 20 kids' videos and then some for teens and then the rest are for adults. Check them out. Make sure if you borrow a DVD from the church that you please fill in all of your information so that we can track you down, we can hunt you down if you don't return it. We appreciate that. And then do make sure you return them. Uh, this week for upcoming events on March 25th, that is tomorrow, we have a senior service at Points West at 7 o'clock p.m. We would love it if you were able to come out and join us as we minister there. This coming Friday, we're going to be having a Good Friday service here at the church at 10 a.m. You're all welcome to come and to join us as we have a, a service here celebrating the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. We'll be having communion at that point. March 31st, so that is Easter Sunday, we are going to be having a potluck dinner after the church service. There is a sign-up sheet in the foyer. I believe it's got most of the places filled in, but if you feel that you must contribute something and it's not there, just write it down and put your name beside it. We'd absolutely love that. Or just bring it for potluck. We would certainly enjoy that as well. Come and join us for a time of food and fellowship after the service. One other announcement in the bulletin I wanted to draw your attention to, and that is that the annual general meeting of the Napa and District Cemetery will be held on April the 5th at 7 p.m. at the Kerbin Brown Building. If you are interested in serving on the Nampa and District Cemetery, they are looking to fill two board positions on that board. Contact Sharon Hibbard for more information or just show up at the meeting. And then uh, before Lauren comes, was there any other announcements aside from the one that Lauren is going to come and, and bring at this time? No? All right, then Lauren Cron is going to come and share an announcement with us. All right. Um, for you guys, for people that are new here or visiting, just this we're just doing a little bit of business here of the church. So pay attention, get to know how some of our church business operates. I guess ask questions later if you want to. But anyways, um, I wrote a script here so I don't stray too far. At the end of February, um, the building committee 
we uh, gave a little presentation at the annual general meeting about the proposed addition and, uh, and kind of gave you guys a, a bit of a budget number. And that budget number was about 1.2 to 1.5 million dollars for, for what we had kind of proposed. Um, at the end of the presentation, we kind of, uh, we, we, we told the church that, you know, go home, pray about it, think about it. And that in the near future, we'd get together and kind of discuss it more and kind of decide if we were going to proceed. We would like to amend that, um, that suggestion. So a few days before the congregational meeting, we managed to, uh, like the building committee, we managed to sit down with our local bank to discuss mortgage options. The church falls under what they call a commercial mortgage which, as we have learned, is much different than a personal mortgage. One of the big things about a commercial mortgage is that they ask someone to be a uh, personal guarantor. And for us, this is not an option. <coughs> so after the, uh, after the church business meeting, we did some other searching, and we s found a few other viable options that would work for us. Now, I'm going to just step back a bit. So some denominations, they have, in their denomination, they have a, a lending arm that supports churches in, in building projects and renovations. So, for instance, the Baptist Church, when they did their renovation 20 years ago, um, it was the, their particular Baptist denomination was able to lend them the money. Same with the Alliance Church. And when they did their renovation addition a couple years ago, it was the Alliance Church that funded it. The EMCC does not have a lending arm. So they leave it up to the churches to find their way through this. And uh, so we're learning. We're finding our way through it. Um, but And luckily, we have found some organizations that are willing to work with us, that, that are willing to lend us some money. However, in our conversations with these, we have found that they would like more information and more details before telling us yes or no. Um, so some of the things that they're kind of asking for uh, to, uh, to help them make a decision is they'd like to see like detailed building quotes. they like to see detailed building plans, um, engineered plans, uh, detailed budget numbers, that kind of stuff. So we as a board, or not as a board, sorry, as a building committee, we, what we are asking is that the church membership approves a release of up to up to $50,000 so that we can move forward to collect some of this information for the church and for the financial institutions. Now, I want to be clear. This is not an approval to give the green light to go ahead with the addition. This is to allow us to gather more information and hammer out some of the details needed. This way, when the time comes, we can present the church with good pen to paper numbers that will help us in our decision making. This sort of situation, it, it's not unusual in the building process and it's part of the cost involved. While this number might sound high, we are dealing with a commercial scenario as opposed to residential scenarios. So again, we're not asking for this vote isn't to proceed with the build. It's this vote is to allow us to take the next steps to gather a bit more information so that we can present these these numbers to the different lending institutions and so that we can also present these numbers to you as a church to help us in our decision making. So the board has discussed this and what we would like to do is on April 11th in the evening, we'd like to come together as a church membership. We can uh, discuss this a little bit further, and at that time, we'll take a vote. So just to be clear, and again, just to make sure everyone is <laughs> aware, the question on Thursday night is to allow the release of up to $50,000 so that the building committee may go ahead with the next steps to gather information and to hammer out a few of these important details. So, yeah, that's about it. Thank you.
So there'll be a meeting here at the church, April the 11th, 7 p.m. And as he mentioned, it is just so that we can uh, say, yes, we agree that you continue to pursue, even though it is going to cost, essentially, that you continue to pursue the building project. And then after that process, there will be, once again, another vote at the point in which they have all of the numbers, everything ironed down and exact, when they can come back to us and say, this is wh exactly what we're looking at. Yes, as a church, we want to proceed with this. Uh, hold on, we've got some questions we want to air. Uh, the meeting on April 11th, it is open to anyone who wants to come. There will be a time of discussion around it. Uh, you can only vote if you are a member. However, we would love to have as many people come, as many questions fielded as possible. We would love that, and I'm sure it'll be a great time together. So that'll be taking place on April 11th. One of the things that we had discussed as a board was also the potential. Um, after our round table discussion, we acknowledged that it would be good if we spent some time in, in prayer and fasting in regards particularly to this decision. So on April 11th, uh, we are calling upon the church, if you are able to spend that day in prayer and fasting, um, up until the meeting, you're free to go home after the meeting and, and uh, you know, satisfy the appetites. But the intent being that throughout that day, and we would encourage you to do it on other days as well, that you would dedicate yourself to prayer and to fast. And so the way that it's a very simple way of doing it, simple way of looking at it, is that you have this thing on your mind which God is, is drawing you towards and ought to be, and we desire that you would be convincing and convicting of one way or the other in regards to the decision. And so every time you're hungry... You spend time in prayer. Even if you can't stop what you're doing, you get that craving, it's a good reminder to go to the Lord. So uh, the board, I, I think the board as a, as a whole has committed to that on April 11th, and we would encourage you to join us in that. If there's more questions in regards to any of these details, please speak with myself or Lauren after the service. Thank you. All right, thank you. I uh, would like to invite you all to stand with us, and we're going to sing a few hymns. We're going to do To God Be the Glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done, so loved he the world that he his son to yield it his life and atonement for sin and open the life gate that all may go in praise the lord praise the lord let the earth hear his voice praise the lord praise the lord let the people rejoice oh come to the father through jesus the son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. O oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things. He hath taught us great things He hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done.
shame And I love that old cross Where the dearest and best For a world of lost sinners was slain And so I'll cherish the old rugged cross Until my trophies at last I lay down And I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown Oh, the old rugged cross so despised by the world as a wondrous attraction for me for the dear lamb of god left his glory above to bear it to dark calvary so i'll cherish the old rugged cross until my trophies at last i lay down and i will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown in the old rugged cross stained with blood so divine a wondrous beauty i see for it was on that old cross jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me so i'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last i lay down and i will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown to the old rugged cross i will ever be true its shame and reproach gladly bear then he'll call me someday to a home far away where his glory forever i'll share so i'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last i lay down and i will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a The last song we'll do this morning is called, uh, Jesus, There is No One Like You. no song we could sing to honor the weight of your glory there is no words we could speak to capture the depth of your beauty Jesus there's no we love you we ever adore you there's no one like you Jesus we love you 
we ever adore you, Lord. There is no sinner beyond the infinite stretch of your mercy. How can we thank you enough for how you have loved us so completely? Jesus, there's no one like you. Jesus, we love you. We ever adore you. There's no We love you, we ever adore you, Lord. And all we have, all we need, all we want is you. There's no one like you, Jesus, we love you, we ever adore you, there's no one like you, Jesus, we love you, we ever adore you. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. There, there is no one like you. No one can do or will do what you have done. God, we just thank you this morning, uh, Lord, for your work in our lives and for your great love, Lord, that you've demonstrated to us, uh, not only in the cross, God, but day to day as believers, how you show your love to us. We thank you for that this morning. We ask your blessing on the rest of the service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning again. We would normally be having the kids go down to nursery right now. I'm going to ask if they would hold off. And Aaron Harbage is here with High Prairie Wilderness Camps. He's going to share a brief uh, slideshow, and then he's going to come up and share with us. And then we'll dismiss the kids down to nursery. So I'm going to ask to turn the slideshow on now. Thank you.
if uh, we can bring up the PowerPoint, that'd be great. So my name's Aaron Harbage. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to come to your church, get in touch with Pastor Dan uh, for a bit over the last couple months. And uh, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who has been part of High Story Wilderness Camp. I know there's a number of you who have either sent, sent your kids or talked to friends about it. They sent their kids down to the camp. Uh, quite a number of you have shown up to some of our fundraisers, and I just want to start by saying thank you very much for your current involvement with High Story Wilderness Camp. Uh, so, yeah, we're obviously with High Story Wilderness Camp, and uh, it's a small camp near High Story. It was launched in 2016. Once we, during, uh, oops, look at that. <laughs> Almost like one of those old horses. Whoa. There we go. Look at that. Let's just hit the presenter button. Okay, no worries. So, uh, if it comes up, we'll, we'll go with it, and if not, we won't. So, High Prairie Wilderness Camp was started in 2016. It was originally part of the Sega Tower Christian Camping Association. In 2021, it was taken over by J2K Ministries, and uh, J2K Ministries is focused on starting and maintaining small wilderness camp locations. So, a lot of camps, typically, they get a spot. They want to get bigger and bigger and bigger. They build dining halls and cabins, which is great. I've worked with some of those camps. And they're awesome, uh, but tip. But J2K Ministries is focused on camps like High Prairie Wilderness Camp, which is never more than about 25 campers at a time. And if the camp ever outgrows that, we either start a new location or we add more, add more camps in the summer. Now, obviously, the focus of High Prairie Wilderness Camp is sharing the gospel, but I would say the camp has a twofold focus that we've worked to develop over the years. And that is a focus on sharing the gospel with the campers and discipling them, but also very intensive focus on working with our staff through the year. So we actually maintain contact with our staff throughout the year. We do staff Bible studies on Zoom. And actually, for those of you who missed Sunday school this morning, you missed a good Sunday school class. Uh, it's Josh, right? Yeah, so Josh was leading talking in Ephesians, and he was talking about the observe uh, the observe, interpret, apply, and we actually have just been going through a full winter of study out of the book, living by the book with our camp staff, going through Ephesians, uh, doing exactly the same thing. So I was, I was, that was actually very exciting to see someone else uh, doing that. So the focus again is is the is the campers, of course, but 50% of the staff, or 50% of our focus is on our staff. Uh, the camp itself is also looking at developing staff training. So a lot of camps have staff training. We're doing with High Prairie Wilderness Camp uh, over the years is we're developing staff training that not only teaches them how to work at camp, but also teaches our staff life skills in leadership, in conflict resolution, in uh, sharing the gospel, going through the gospel, what is the gospel. And so our camp staff training is actually very intensive. It's about two and a half days of a very intense staff training. There's not a lot of free time at all. It starts in the morning right after breakfast and goes uh, right on through till till nighttime, not that much, bedtime. Uh, so it's a very, very solid focus on our on our staff. Whoa, look at this. This is awesome. All right. So we'll back up just a little bit. So uh, it's for ages, our camps are for ages 12 to 18. So High Prairie Wilderness Camp focuses on that 12 to 17 years old. And then Summit Mountain Camp, which is the camp we launched last year, goes up to 18, the 14 to 18 years old. Uh, we have High Prairie Wilderness Camp, of course, the one we're talking about this morning, down near High Prairie, about 20 minutes southwest. I don't know if any of you know Len Park. Uh, it's on his land there along the Little Smoky River Valley. And our purpose, of course, is to share the gospel with the campers. Let's go to the next slide, which uh, looks like we're not getting it to do the next slide. There we go. Our vision is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to the unsaved and promote a culture and worldview where believers are discipled to passionately serve Jesus Christ. We could unpack that a lot, but we're short on time. And our mission is to use training, Bible study, and biblical counseling to create a place for disciples to thrive in their walk with God, building relationships through outdoor activities. I'll touch on this quickly for a moment. That is our cabins at High Prairie Wilderness Camp right there. They're canvas teepees, about 22 foot diameter. We actually did a poll once, should we go to wall tents or teepees? It was a resounding teepees, 100% teepees. So that's, that's where we're at. If we can go to the next slide. Uh, behind J2K, so people say, well, are you not High Prairie Wilderness Camp? We are High Prairie Wilderness Camp, but High Prairie Wilderness Camp is run and maintained by J2K Ministries. And so people say, well, what does that mean? Well, it's actually Journey to the Kingdom. Uh, if you have ever heard of Pilgrim's Progress, 
uh, in the story where Christian is on this life journey, and there's people that come into his life along the way, and they disciple him and mentor him and accompany him and encourage him, and that is the vision behind the name JTK. So we can move on to the next slide. I think that we'll skip over to the next slide. And if you're not going to go there, then you can come back. That's okay. Again, sometimes horses do the same thing. They either cross the creek. I guess they're not. Okay, I guess we're crossing the creek. Yeah. So Heisberg Wilderness Camp has room for about 25 campers at one time. Again, ages at 12 to 17. We have three girls' teepees and one boy's teepee. You say, why the difference? What do you think? Horses? We get lots of girls back there. Uh, so it, it typically, that's about the balance. We get about eight, eight boys to about 16, 17 girls that come. And uh, we have, there we go, look at this, total of 75 campers through the summer. We run the month of August. And uh, sweet Santa, sweet and Santa's teepee. Food is prepared in our outdoor kitchen. We saw Jerry Bergen with our cook last summer. And uh, we, they cook up tons of bacon and stuff like that on their outdoor fireplace there. Our dining hall is a very fancy tarp and full frame structure. It's a lot of fun. There's rain and it's great. Uh, it does keep the rain out, but it is loud. It's a lot of fun. A lot of outdoor games, morning and evening chapel. And uh, we've had comments about the family atmosphere, how peaceful it is. The kids love coming. They love that it's peaceful. They love that the staff takes time to talk with them. One of the highlights of Heifer Wilderness Camp is it's not run by a bell. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Peace Country Wilderness Camp, also not run by a bell, so very, very similar, where there's time for conversation. And that's the whole idea behind Hyper Wilderness Camp and the mission, is to be able to have conversations with the kids. We get a lot of kids that are not churched. I would say probably 90% of our kids are not churched. Uh, we have them coming in from Kadot Lake. We have them coming in from Gift Lake or Kitmanag. Uh, all over the place, so it's not actually a church camp. We get some Bible camps or church camps. This is not a church camp, not that we don't welcome Christian kids, but it actually attracts a lot of kids who come from you know, Native spiritualism backgrounds or have maybe a little bit of Catholicism mixed in. Maybe some of their parents are from the residential schools, that kind of thing. Uh, and, of course, we have kids from all over the Calaire, Grand Prairie, Valley View, all that, all that area, from as far away as Edmonton. But again, I'd say probably 90% unchurched. So a huge focus on sharing the gospel. And so when we get those comments about this is like a peaceful family, it's so good to be here, I hope I never leave, all that kind of stuff, it lets us know that we're hitting the right, hitting the right tone where they're, they're engaged with the conversations about the gospel of who God is and who Jesus is, but also they have that sense that there's something different about the staff and the camp atmosphere. So we can go to the next slide. So last summer we had a total of 67 campers, lots of miles covered on horseback. We had multiple campers from low-income families respond. So we get a lot of kids who come in, some from social services, but also some from families where the parents are, you know, they're in rehab or whatnot. Maybe the kids are staying with their grandparents. And so we get a lot of kids from, from those backgrounds. We had one young fellow come in, anti-God, nothing happening, uh, you know, spiritually flatlined, right? And he, sa he said at the last day of camp, he says, you can't come to High Prairie Wilderness Camp and leave without knowing there is a God. And so he told us at campfire, he says, you know, he says, I'm not giving my life to Christ yet. He says, I will tell you this. He says, I do now believe that there is a God, and I'm going to be going home to study this more to find out more about Christianity because of what you guys have taught me this week. I think he's about 15 years old. So definitely, definitely some interesting stuff. We can go to the next slide. This year, we already have 40 campers signed up for High Prairie Wilderness Camp. We have some great staff coming again. We still need some head cooks, wranglers, and teepee leaders. Uh, our, all our speakers, we have Dwight Munn. Dwight Munn, some of you uh, might know Dwight Munn from um, uh, the Wembley Church, All the Nations Church. He used to be at West Point in Grand Prairie. He's been speaking at camp for years. Martin Verblut, Matthew Peters. Some of you know might, Matt, might know Matt Peters from uh, our Baptist Church in High Prairie where I attend. So he's our pastor there. He's going to be speaking this summer. We have our full-time seasonal facilities manager. And, of course, we're continuing to develop our staff training. We can switch the slides Sometimes people ask, how can I help? Well, yeah. prayer. That is something that we really value, is people praying for camp. Uh, if you can pray for salvation and spiritual growth among the campers and staff, pray that we have the right staff that come. Pray that the campers come. You say, well, camp, why pray for campers? Well, sometimes we have waiting lists, but we know that God has campers that he wants to be at camp to hear the gospel. We see campers getting saved, and so we know that even though we can't fit them all, Pray that God sends the right campers that need to hear the gospel. 
Pray for our horses. Anybody that's ever worked at horse camp? Sore horses, lame horses, sick horses. You can have them 11 months of the year and feed them all year and they're healthy. You bring them to camp and something happens, right? So pray for the horses, pray for safety, finances, practical ways. Uh, there's camp set up and take down. The place obviously doesn't stay up all year. The teepees go up, they come down, need help with that. Firewood work days, that's an easy way to get a lot of people involved, just splitting and stacking firewood, hauling firewood. Food organization, purchasing and delivery. Uh, help with administration and fundraisers. A lot is done through online collaboration. So even if people don't live right in High Prairie, we can easily plug people in. And of course, spreading the word, which is what we're doing here. So if you're interested in staying on our newsletter updates or getting a uh, twice a year printed newsletter, you can easily sign up on our website or scan that on your phone. There's also a QR code on the, at the uh, display at the back there. You can scan that on your phone. That takes you to our sign up page and you can sign up for that. So if you do have questions about the camp, if you know kids that might be interested in coming to camp, uh, you can definitely talk to me. I'll be around the back after the service. And thank you very much for the opportunity to come and share about High Prairie Wilderness Camp and what's happening there. Really appreciate it. God bless. Children ages three and under. Am I coming through the speakers? Testing one, two. Children ages three and under can go down to nursery if you like or if your parents like. We're going to look into the Word of God this morning. We're going to go briefly to prayer before we do that. You can take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 11 if you would. Mark chapter 11. As you're turning there, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have opportunity this morning to gather together. We thank you for the joy and the privilege that it is to be part of the body of Christ and to be able to worship together, to celebrate the name of Jesus Christ together, and to be able to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you that your word is going out across pulpits this morning, and not just through the churches, but also that this summer and beyond, your word is going out through organizations like High Prairie Wilderness Camp, and we pray for the camps this morning. Lord, we pray for your provision for them. We pray for your blessing upon them. We pray for High Prairie Wilderness Camp and for Riverside and Sturgeon Lake and all the rest of the Bible camps that are in this area. And we just ask, Lord, that you would even now be equipping them and preparing them, that you would be gathering together the staff that you would have there, that you would make sure that their hearts, their minds are focused on you even in lead up to camp. Lord, I pray as well for the kids that will be coming to camp. We pray that even now you would be preparing the soil of their heart, that they may receive the seed of your word and that it would bear much fruit. Lord, we pray for the financial needs and the physical needs of these camps and ask that you would bless them abundantly. We ask that you would lay it upon the heart of other people to come alongside of these camps and to support them and encourage them in every way that is necessary. Lord, we commit the Harbage family to you this morning and ask that you would bless them abundantly, that you would continue to go before them, to guide and direct them, to provide for them, to be the, the source of satisfaction in all things that are necessary. We rejoice, Lord, that we know that you are more than able to accomplish that. We thank you, Lord, that we have opportunity this morning to look into your word. We pray that you would guide us by your Holy Spirit, that you would give us hearts and minds that are willing and receptive to hear from you and to bring our lives into line with the truth of your word, to, to bear it out, practically speaking, by the enabling of your Holy Spirit. For we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Today is Palm Sunday, when we celebrate the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. Now, if you're here for Sunday school, you knew all about that. Some of you might be the first time you're hearing that today is Palm Sunday. We're talking about the triumphal entry. That's, you know, it's not on any calendars, at least it wasn't on my calendar. <laughs> I looked and it wasn't on there. I don't know the last time that Palm Sunday has been on a calendar. This is not a marked celebration. It's not specifically a sacred day. It's not a mandatory celebration. I even just considered continuing in our series in 1 Corinthians this morning. Then I thought, well, maybe we should back up a, you know, and slow down a, a bit anyways. 
because although Palm Sunday is not really a remarkable date itself, it introduces the beginning of the week of the most remarkable event in all of human history. Palm Sunday is the prelude to Good Friday and to Easter Sunday. It is a prelude to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that is a most remarkable event. It is interesting, though, that the prelude of the resurrection, Palm Sunday, seems like such a strange prelude. Palm Sunday seems to be misplaced in history. The entry of Christ into Jerusalem was celebrated by those who would shortly cry out for his death. And Christ knew full well that although there was this air of festivity on his arrival to Jerusalem, that he was entering Jerusalem to die a criminal's death. He was entering Jerusalem to die to pay for the sin of mankind. So although this was a time of rejoicing, it is also a time of great sorrow in one sense. Rejoicing because the king has come. The liberator of his people has arrived. But sorrow because, for a couple of reasons at least, one, it reveals the fickleness of the human heart. That within a very short period of time, we assume anyways that these same people that praised him and sang Hosanna to him were crying out, crucify him. But it also introduces the agony of our Lord Jesus Christ. You would have thought the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem would be after his agony, his death, his resurrection. If I was arranging the sequence of events, that would likely have been the case. It makes sense that it's, it's at the, the highest moment that you have him coming in and being praised by the people. But it was necessary that it unfolded the way it did. It was necessary for Christ to be recognized as the king before his humiliation. If he had been just another great man or even another great leader, he would not have been able to purchase our salvation. But Jesus Christ is the king. He is the Messiah. He is the promised one who came to deliver his people from their sins. He wouldn't do that as a result of riling up the people to rebel or to revolt against the Roman rulers. He wouldn't accomplish that by the populist vote. He wouldn't even do it through the strength of his own arm or an army. On Palm Sunday, Jesus Christ was inaugurated as a king. But just a few days after this, he would lay down his life as the perfect sacrifice. And what we see in the account of Palm Sunday is the celebration of the king. It is ascribing to Christ what was rightfully his. The people likely didn't know fully who he was or how Christ was going to be the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises, but in their action and in their praise, they were acknowledging Jesus Christ and acknowledging him as the Messiah. They were giving the Christ his due. And I pray that, that we would have the same heart of praise and of worship as they did. I pray that now that we have fuller understanding of the person and the work of Jesus Christ, we would have an even greater response of praise and worship than they did on that Sunday morning, Palm Sunday. The account of the entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem is contained in all four of the Gospels, but this morning we're going to read it from Mark chapter 11, verse 1 to 11. So it's Mark chapter 11, verse 1 to 11. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and he said to them, go into the village opposite you and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and immediately he will send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, what are you doing loosing the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded. So they let them go. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. 
And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around at all these things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Amen. This is a beautiful passage here this morning. This is how Christ should be treated at, at all times and by all people. This is how Christ ought to be viewed This is how we ought to be thinking of him today as the great king over all. And one day prayerfully, prayerfully soon, the king of kings will come through the skies with power and glory to physically establish his kingdom. He has been inaugurated. inaugurated. This is his inauguration. And yet one day, I believe soon, he is coming to rule and reign. So who is this king who is coming to rule and reign? Who is this king according to this passage, according to this praise-filled celebration about Jesus Christ? Who is this king? I'd like you to see just three things about him this morning. The first is that Christ is the heavenly king. This is not a complicated passage. This is not a complicated message. And these are certainly not complicated points. Jesus Christ is the heavenly king. In the praises of the people, we see that Christ is no earthly king. Once we are past the introduction of this great event, and and even there we see wonder at Christ's miraculous works and how he commanded these people that he didn't know to release a colt, and he commands an untrained colt to obey him, and they obey him. But once we are past that introduction, we come to this section of praise and adoration. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. As it is recorded here, the people start out crying, Hosanna. Hosanna literally means, O save, or save now. Originally, it was meant as a cry for help, a plea for help. It was used by a supplicant going before, say, a king and pleading their case before them. Maybe they had a wrong that had been against them and they wanted it rectified or a grievance and they wanted it settled. And they would go and they would say this phrase, this expression, Hosanna, save now or rescue now. Over time, the definition of the word, though, and the common use of it, it changed. And it became just this common recital and the singing of various psalms, particularly during festivals and feasts. The Jews at the end of these psalms would would often cry out, Hallelujah, or Hosanna. And so the word Hosanna, though literally asking God to save them, had also become a simple response of praise, acknowledging God's salvation. In a sense, it is saying salvation has come, rather than saying, please save us, although that was absolutely the case And Jesus Christ was coming as the Savior, and they're crying out in that sense, please save us, and yet it is saying, Hosanna, salvation has come from God. When you combine the word Hosanna with blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, there can be no doubt that these celebrants believed God was sending his deliverer in Jesus Christ. Anyone who comes in the name of the Lord or comes in the name of another comes in the full authority of that individual. Now here, these people are not quite acknowledging, at least not all of them, they're not quite acknowledging Christ's divinity here, but they were acknowledging that he was sent from God. And that is remarkable itself. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is an Old Testament quote. Literally, it is blessed is he who comes in the name of Jehovah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the eternal, self-existent God. They cried this out, quoting from Psalm 118 verse 26. Psalm 118 verse 26 to 29 says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Jehovah. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords on the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. When they are saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, it is not describing a mere man. Blessed is he who comes in the name and the authority and the power of Jehovah God. Blessed is he who comes. And and in that context of Psalm 118, you are my God and I will serve you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord Jehovah 
for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. This was not a mere prophet coming in the name of the Lord. This was not a mere teacher coming in the name of the Lord. This was the Messiah, Jesus Christ, coming in the full authority of the eternal self-existent God. Now, the religious rulers would not have acknowledged that Jesus Christ was God's chosen Redeemer, the Messiah. They, they were looking for a Messiah, at, at least in word, but they did not, ref, did not acknowledge Jesus Christ as that Messiah. But it's interesting because the common people did. They saw him as that Messiah, that promise of God. I pray we never get so religious that we miss God. Right? So the common people here, they acknowledge that this is the Messiah of God. They sang to him. They danced before him. They waved branches before him. The people even go so far as to cry out, Hosanna in the highest. That is both imploring the very heavens to sing forth the praises of God for his coming Savior, but also imploring God to reach down from heaven in salvation. Hosanna in the highest. The whole environment and celebration is full of, of praise for the heavenly king. In John chapter 11, verse 25 to 27, we have a portion of the interaction between Jesus Christ and Martha surrounding the death of her brother Lazarus. Jesus said, and you all know this passage, but Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Martha's response, note this. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This acknowledgement, this declaration, this profession Jesus is the one who comes. Jesus is the one who brings salvation. Jesus, this resurrection and the life. What kind of king is he? He is our heavenly king. He is that promised Messiah. He is the promised Redeemer. He is the Son of God who has come into the world. He is our heavenly king and we worship him. Not only is he our heavenly king, but he is, Christ is the eternal king. The people not only cried out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They went on saying, blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. The kingdom of their father David was the eternal kingdom. God had promised that he would rule and reign on the throne of David forever. Time and time we see that promise in the Old Testament that it would be an eternal throne, going back even to the promise of the Messiah, one that we're far more familiar with in, in Christmas. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 to 7, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from this time forward, even forever. Ezekiel proclaims the same promise of God in regards to the Davidic throne. He says in Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 23 to 24, I will establish one shepherd over them and he shall feed them, my servant David. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken it. King David lived sometime between 1003 B.C. to 963 B.C., but the book of Ezekiel was written some 300 years later, between 590 and 570 B.C., Ezekiel here, when he says, I will establish one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, my servant David, is not speaking about King David that we're familiar with. He's speaking of Jesus Christ. Both Ezekiel and Isaiah are speaking of the coming eternal king, Jesus Christ. He will rule on the throne and over his kingdom with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. He is the eternal prince. He is the eternal king king. That promise was reiterated to Mary by the angel before the birth of Jesus Christ. And behold, you will conceive in your womb 
and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Jesus Christ came to reign on the throne of David, but as the eternal king. The people on the streets of Jerusalem almost 2,000 years ago, they acknowledged this. They knew that God had promised to restore the throne of David and establish an eternal kingdom. Certainly, there was a lot they didn't understand. They were looking for the Christ to be a conquering king while Jesus Christ came as the suffering servant. But he was still the king. He is still the king. The people recognized him as the king. They recognized him as the one who would reign on the throne of David forever. The kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Just as they recognized that Christ himself came in the name of the Lord Jehovah, they also recognized that the kingdom of God that was being established by this eternal king came in the name. It was established in the name of of the Lord, in the authority of the Lord. This was being carried out by the will, by the sovereign decree, by the ordaining of God. God has ordained that Jesus Christ is and will be forever the eternal king. He was inaugurated then, but one day, very soon, he is returning in in might and power. One day he will come and reign as the eternal king bodily. Revelation chapter 5, verse 13 And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Jesus Christ, the eternal Lamb, but also, praise God, the eternal King. Christ is not only the eternal King, He is the exalted King. Now, when I say that he is the exalted king, I do not mean, according to this passage, that at this point in the story that he has been exalted, because that is yet to come. His eternal exaltation came after his death, burial, and resurrection, and his ascension into heaven. What I mean by Christ being the exalted king here is that Christ was the worshipped king. Christ was the adored king. Christ was the praised king. In that sense, he is the exalted king. They exalt him even here. They praise him and they worship him. One of the distinctions between Christ and and great prophets or even Christ and angels was that they could not be worshipped, but Jesus Christ can. He can be exalted. Throughout the word of God, if there was some angel who came to man it was likely that man would fall down on their knees and begin to worship them, and without fail, the angel would tell that person, no, don't worship me. I can't be worshipped. I'm not God. I'm a created being. Worship God alone. They were saying that an angel even is unworthy of worship. We see that all of mankind and angels and every created thing are not worthy of worship. Only God is worthy of, of true worship. Only God should be bowed before as the ultimate. Jesus could not receive worship and praise if he was not God in the flesh. But he is God in the flesh. And so he received their exaltation. He received their praise. In the account of this Palm Sunday celebration by Luke, we see these words. In Luke chapter 19, verse 37 to 40. The whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him, that is to Christ, from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Even the stones would immediately cry out. Why did the Pharisee tell Christ, or the Pharisees tell Christ to to rebuke the disciples? He told them to rebuke the disciples because they were worshiping Christ, because they were giving praise that ought to be reserved for God to someone the Pharisees refused to believe was God. They were essentially guilty of blasphemy in the eyes of the Pharisees. And Jesus, by receiving that praise, was equally as guilty of blasphemy, except that he is God. And Christ's response to these Pharisees, 
if these people keep, keep silent, the stones will immediately cry out. Christ will be exalted. Christ will be exalted. He is exalted. If not by men, then even by inanimate objects, objects, they will rise up and praise him because Christ is the exalted king. This is the king that we serve. This is the king that, that we follow even before his death, burial, and resurrection. Even before his death, burial, and resurrection and ascension, Jesus is the heavenly king. Jesus is the eternal king. And Jesus Christ is the exalted king. Those were all there in seed form on that Palm Sunday over 2,000 years ago. But what was there in seed form has grown into full maturity in Jesus Christ. Now Christ has died. He has been buried. He has been raised from the dead. He has ascended to heaven. Christ, our heavenly king. And even though he will one day soon come in glory and set his feet upon the earth and rule here with a rod of iron, he will still be our heavenly king. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 to 16. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on a white horse, or white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nation, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of, his, of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. <coughs> Jesus Christ is our heavenly king. Jesus Christ is our eternal king upon the throne of David forever and ever. And Jesus Christ is our exalted king. Therefore, God also has given him a name or has highly exalted him and given him a name, Philippians chapter 2, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on the earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. From the time of Palm Sunday to today and for all of eternity, Jesus Christ is the exalted King. May our reflection today and in this week May our lives be a reflection of these worshipers that Palm Sunday. Seeing him for who he is, acknowledging him for who he is, and worshiping him for who he is. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have revealed Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ, you are the revelation of God to us. You manifested, you demonstrated your love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ, you came and you died for us. It is beyond our ability to imagine that the King of kings and Lord of lords has laid down his life in the place of sinners. And yet we trust it because you have revealed it. And we worship you and we glory in it and we delight in it. And I pray that in this holy week, this, this week of celebration of, of the finished work of Jesus Christ, that our mind would be fixed upon you. Not just in your humility, although we will examine that and consider that, but in your standing, in your glory, in your wonder, in your awe as that eternal, exalted, heavenly King. May our mind and our heart be so fixed upon you that if it is within this holy week that you return in might and power, there would be no change in our heart. We would, we would have a heart that is fixed on you already. And we would joyfully celebrate your presence there, that we would, we would take off whatever it is, our robe or whatever, and we would cast it before you. And we would continue to sing as these 
as these worshipers did, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, grant us a heart like that. Grant us a, an attitude, an appetite, a desire like that, that we would worship you, for you alone are worthy. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you very much for coming. I pray that you'll have a Christ-exalting Palm Sunday. And just a reminder that if you'd like to talk with the Harbages, they will be out at the back at their table. God bless.